council leader and from a few others that our group, Stop the Hoylake Golf Resorts Action Group, Defend Whittles Green and Open Spaces, Greensby Green Belt Action Group, that we're, we are giving out misinformation. Well, I can tell you or not. The only ones giving misinformation out are <coughs> Phil Davis, the leader, and Jim Anderson from the Nicholas Joint Venture Group. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Jim Anderson came to the Whittle two weeks ago. He was on the radio, he was everywhere. He did say, when he was here, that he wanted to meet with the opposition groups and talk to us. For three years we tried to get hold of that man and we could not get hold of him. He came to Whittle, as I say, to say he wants to speak to us, nothing. We've not been approached by anyone. So the misinformation doesn't come from us, it comes from the leader and Nicholas Joint Venture Group. But I'll just say this to finish. In May, you've got a chance to vote for a councillor. Philip Brightmore is a cabinet member. Angela Davis of Prenton is a cabinet member. Both are up for election. We are going to target them. All our group, we are 260, 300 strong. We are going to target them. We are going to put leaflets through the door. And we are going to tell the residents the truth and what is happening. And this is your chance, your family's chances, your friends' chances, to get rid of these two people off that cabinet and give us a chance on this golf resort. Thank you very much. see if I've got this, this right. We have an organisation that doesn't have any money, that then gets money from the council in order to make it a profit of quite a significant development of 200 million. We then sign a contract with that company that is almost worthless and public money is used to pay for it to devise a scheme to make it profit. And then we have no fallout that if that business goes bust, they can sue us, but we can't sue them because they will have wound up their business. And we can actually sell the houses that they haven't built with our money. Is that about the right thing, Dave? <laughs> Try and answer uh, the, the question there. So, there is the Nicholas Joint Venture Group who came through a competitive process um, and were the preferred developers. Um, and were the preferred um, developer for the golf resort. Now, okay, you just listen to me and then you can uh, follow up from there. So. Now that's how, that's how the Nicholas Joint Venture Group came forward um, as a company that was promoting the golf resort. Now they've identified a number of partners with which they're working to develop the golf resort project. So those at the present time are Celtic Manor and also Red Row as the major house builder. So the, the council has entered into a development agreement with the Nicholas Joint Venture Group which is standard in these types of projects. And that sets out within it a range of sort of terms and conditions and clauses of how each party is going to work together and what they're going to do. I think, to be fair, David, 
we, and I'm conscious there are people here to ask other questions. I think the point David made was, who's going to pay for houses? How are they going to give us the £26 million pounds back if they haven't built any houses? I think that's the basic point. Well, I, I just need to give the explanation so you can see it in context. But I think we've all heard the context several times. Because the houses will be owned by Redrow as well, won't they? Yeah. 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 There'll be a, a commercial arrangement in terms of how that is lined up for the prudential borrowing loan which the council would offer on a commercial loan basis and on those terms and conditions for which we would get a sum of money for that, which is two and a half million pounds as part of that. Um, and, and that's how it would be structured commercially. If you like. Now, there's a longer explanation. I'm happy to speak to you outside the meeting, David, if you want to go through. That would be helpful. Yeah. Julie, you've been trying to get in for a little well, while. Is this your first go at the committee? And it will be the last the first go of the last committee. No way you go. Uh, it, was, it was just basically just to clarify, obviously I can't speak for Philly, not here, but just to say that, am I sorry, I think it should be organised over there. Just, um, just to clarify that, that we have spoken to the to the Green Belt people, I mean Karen came on Saturday to depend on the you out. No, yes. honestly she has Karen to come to a public meeting that okay. I've been okay. in. I think Phil meant we haven't met the group of councillors. Oh sorry. We've met the Labour group individually. But what I'm just trying to say is that honestly we have listened and under the council constitution as it stands there is nothing, that vote wasn't meaningful on the day, I know Jeff disagrees, but under the current constitution it's a cabinet decision, obviously things may well change after May and we'll have to wait and see and that was a choice that we made as a group of councillors that, that Councillor Norbury did put out there. Um, very succinctly. So I just want to say that we have listened and um, just to make that aware, and as well, several occasions. Okay. All right, that's helpful. That's, that's helpful, Kate. Uh, so thank you for that. I, I think, broadly speaking, and you yeah, forgive me, but it seems to be, you know, really we disagreed, but we decided to vote in favour. That was the, I think, the Councillor Norbury. Position. The, uh, the momentum position on this is we think one thing and we went another way. Right. To avoid confusion, I'm going to give everyone an opportunity. So I'll move from the chair. This is our last meeting, and I've tried to uh, keep the discussion going, but it is our last meeting. So this committee disagrees with the ongoing development of the Hoylake Celtic Manor Golf Resort and calls on the Cabinet to change its mind and end this development. So I'm going to propose that. Is that seconded? A range of people have seconded it, if anyone's watching. Does anyone briefly now want to speak to that at all? Okay, so everyone now has the opportunity to vote and there can be absolute clarity for the cabinet about where the constituency committee stands on this. So can I have an indication of those in favour? Stop in it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just I thought you'd that later. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? So just just so we're absolutely clear that this committee, those present, um, we have voted, um, however many number it was, to end the golf resort and to inform the leader of the council about that to stop it. No one was prepared to vote against that and to vote in support of the golf resort, and we had one abstention. I think that's pretty fundamental in terms of where this whole scheme is going and I do hope the council will listen because the reason people have done that tonight, we've all had a long standing, but the reason I've done that tonight is because of you and because of the pressure that you have exerted. And my recommendation to you <coughs> is to stay organised and to make that, maintain that pressure. So these words and that we see are translated into action. So thank you very much for the work that you've done in coming here and maintaining that pressure. Thanks very much. For that. I'm 
going to move the agenda around a little bit, if that's okay. We are time limited. Uh, uh, um, are people content if we go over a little bit past our nine o'clock closing time? So I'm going to try and, I know it says 20, 15 minutes, but it's going to have to be down to 20, I'm afraid. But if we do community question time now, are people content with that as an approach? Yes. Yes. Can I have an indication of people who've got questions, please? The lady at the back. To why, is this, why is this going to be the last meeting? Who decided that? Uh, the cabinet. cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did make up. I did make the point about people that wanted different centres of voices and so on and so on. But that was the decision that was made. There was a gentleman behind, and I do know this chap, John. He was the gentleman behind John. Um, I'm Peter Sorridge, I live in Hoyling, and I, uh, I represent the Friends in Retirement Table Tennis Club, ah, yes. which plays at West Kirby Concourse twice a week. Yeah. It has 80 members, with 30 to 40 play in each session, so together we pay the rural council something like £8,000 a year, plus the car parking fees of course. Yes. And the importance of this sort of activity for people like us, whose average age is about 70, is evident from numerous government and NHS reports, and I don't think anybody would dispute it. The four tables that we play on have been in use since the club started 30 years ago, and they're seriously dilapidated. The chairman of the uh, Wirral well, Table Tennis League has seen me <coughs> describe them as very substandard. Now, our member has been on the self help generation, so we have supplied new nets, we have fitted new casters when the concourse could not. I was delighted to see in page 12 of the March issue of the Council's Wirral View newspaper the headline, Wirral's Leisure Centres Get in Shape for Healthy Future, <laughs> above a report which states that West Kirby Concourse will receive, will receive a share of £340,000, which it will spend on replacement of consoles. I assume these consoles are for the gym, which is machinery only about three years old. Four new table tennis tables would cost not much more than £1,000. And my question is, are we the forgotten generation? Yes. Uh, well, I think the answer there is you are forgotten by yourself. Um, we have a, I think we, someone, you've sent this question in as well, haven't you? And there will be a reply coming to you. It's a bit bland, if you don't mind me saying so. It's all that's been a new manager, he's the new team leader, and he'll get to it. So, uh, I just think that's shocking, to be honest. I just do. Uh, one of the things that the new changes are introducing <coughs> is that councillors will have indicative budgets that they can pull in terms of whatever. What I'd suggest is have a word with this um, chap from the. Uh, from the concourse, this new chap, Mr. Mike Henderson. Uh, and if you don't no, get any... Excuse me, is this Dave Simpson? No, Mike Henderson. So, have a word with him. If you don't get any progress, come back to us and we will find a way of making sure you get those, uh, you get those, uh, mask uh, those tables and tables. Thank you very much. Uh, more questions from the uh, floor. John, I'm going to let John uh, because he's tried several times. Mr. Heath, so come on, you've got a question. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, loads of questions, actually. I'll and try they, to get to one. Yeah, okay, I mean, some of them will be in court. Um, be called on. David. <laughs> David? He's <laughs> awake, he's awake. <laughs> um, several quick questions, if I may. Um, these two are green belt. Um, what I would like to know, first of, first of all, why, after um, having uh, our plan go out, let the plan go out of date in 2001, why we have missed every single deadline, including the one on the 24th of January, had this year, had we had a local plan in place, had you produced a local plan in place by then, we would not have been even having to consider the standard method that all other councils from now on are having to do. Why have you put us in that position? Secondly, um, there are no targets. 
Why has this council consistently said they are being forced to do to build 12,000 new houses? That is total rubbish. Three Secretary of States have told you you're wrong. The Department has told you you're wrong. And Homes England have even told you you're going the wrong way. Why are you following that approach? It can only be through pressure. Then, if you build 12,000 houses, where are we going to get 20,000 plus additional people from to come to the world? It's that much of nonsense. We're talking about 20,000 people coming to the world that are not here at the moment. It's just total nonsense. And even, even then, at the moment, I don't know if people know this, but 40% of the people who work and reside on the Wirral commute off the Wirral to work. Yeah. That is not a sustainable model when nowadays you are supposed to live and work in close proximity. But they must, the, uh, the joint, joint um, the local region of SIT, um, not committees, their uh, authorities. And they have just said, nah, we're not going to build any houses over here for, um, towards that 12,000. Well, look, we're already, we're already on Wirral taking up the slack of people that work out of the Wirral. It doesn't make sense. The next question is, in 2014, it passed went to see David in exasperation. Great meeting. We were given assurances about Greenbelt development. And not only that, he wrote to us formally with the, the council uh, policy on Greenbelt. And it says in that, that they have met, the policy says that there is no need to release any Greenbelt land till at least 2028. <coughs> That's four to five years ago. What's happened since? Right? All the big developments that they thought were going to happen to do with the motor industry and to do with the Chinese are nowhere near. The growth that they predicted is not happening. The job's not happening. I've come to the end in about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> So, no, I haven't As you know, Jeff, I've done my speaking. Because um, I get interrupted by you. Um, you you be upset me now. Um, so, the only thing that's happened since we had the letter, the official document from yourself that said nothing needs to be done, no release of Greenbelt until 2028, is that the growth potential, the potential, the uh, growth figures for population have all gone down. Okay? So, ordinary people, including myself, cannot understand the fundamentals of this when it's all gone down and we're suddenly going to have 20,000 people here building houses in the wrong area. Now, this is where every uh, everybody except the, ca the uh, cabinet seems to be of a mind. But what we should be doing is redeveloping yeah. in the areas of our uh, world that need it. Yeah. 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 And we are not doing it. And there is another one I wanted to say, but I'll save that for the inspector. Thank you. Well done, sir. While you're formulating your answer, David, could I just say, uh, and again, it's about uh, the people that come here to these sessions. There is so much talent and ability out in the uh, in the community. So John is doing all this off his own back as part of a volunteer with it past and with the uh, support of the Green Belt. And there are so many volunteers around and about that give their own time, effort, and frankly, 
expertise that it's, it's one of those things that I find astonishing that the council itself and council officers seem to, seem to wish to ignore rather embrace and actually listen to some of those experts that we have out in the community who have the expertise and certainly are prepared to give their time. I find it <coughs> astonishing that a council who we are told to strap the cash, even though they've been 26 million to that, uh, you know, can, can allow that resource to go untapped. I find it astonishing. So thank you, John, for the work that you do <coughs> and your team do. Really appreciate it. Mr. Paul. <laughs> yes, now, there were quite a lot of questions there, John, yeah. you asked. If you get one of those, will take a little bit of time to answer. I'll so try. You, you, is there anything particularly, would you be happy with a written answer? Yeah, can John? you give you a written answer? That's absolutely um, fine. Uh, yeah. Bearing in mind that I can speak with other written Yeah, okay. I have had written answers before. Um, and, you know, well, we'll make it start with it. Yeah, okay. okay. All right. That's, the, that's the issue with a 10 part question. All right. Okay. Right, so we'll get a written, and you'll send a written answer. Yeah, I'm quite happy to meet up with John and have a discussion as well. Okay, and make sure that's limited too. That would be super. Any final questions about uh, yeah, the gentleman on the right, if I may? Um, not too long ago, we had a meeting with um, Mr. Mosley from Peter Holwitz uh, in um, Heswell. And one of the things that he stated was that they have enough brown belt land available to them to erect 14,000 homes. Right? Yeah. And we also have 4,500 empty homes on the world. Why are we building on the green belt? Why aren't we regenerating the areas? Right? And that goes to a council member, because these are the people who voted you in. Right? Because they come, a lot of them come, Birkenhead, Rock Ferry, New Ferry. Right? And they're the areas that need renovating. The whole, the whole of that side, the Peel Holdings are being held back by this council. Right? It's about time you got off your backside, sorted things out, and protected the green belt, instead of listening to the Gang of Four, who control the facility. Differences, robust differences, but amicable. Remember that. I'm get just. Get, I just want an indication because you, you, yeah, you've had to go. Through, but is there anybody else? I don't want to upset the people from uh, from the Heron Road sort of uh, road safety scheme. The gentleman here, go on. Have you got the microphone? Uh, Roy Buskin from Derby. Um, prior to that. I uh, lived in the area to which you refer, the golf shows. And uh, 75 years on ago, I was He's running my, around all those things as a teenager. As a teenager. And uh, I've, um, my, my son is a, a surveyor and a land agent working for Give You Mistakes, so he knows the world quite well. I spoke to him a little bit about this. But um, I also have another relative. Um, and I know plenty of farmers who have been farming that area. So I'm quite aware of the situation. I've heard um, comments from Jerry before about the flooding. I endorse that fully. Um, I'm not at all confident. When I heard David Bell say a few minutes ago, I wasn't a sense he said that this wonderful company that has spent, you've spent, they've spent millions on, that they haven't had a survey of the ground. Now, is that true? If it's true, it's criminal. No way should the, the council be planning houses and this complex without having a survey. I know that the, the, the people who have been planning that land and working on it for years and years and years. I've also had some experience of um, planning of houses and on Greenbelt possibly, I don't know, years ago, by Liso, Liso Station on yeah. the They built land which was flooded regularly, I remember as a, as a teenager. And they built, and then they realised when they started building, they had to pile drive a huge distance down, concrete piles all over that ground, 
they had put slabs of concrete on it. It cost a fortune. What's going to happen? They've obviously spent millions on this, or whatever it is. When they start building, they're going to have to prepare that ground in a similar way, in my opinion. I don't know. But I can't believe that a survey hasn't been done. I'm, I'm not at all confident with the way the council, uh, in, a, in a simple way, many, some years ago, the council had an architect in to um, produce plans to extend the, the, the Lisa Lighthouse for a, a, resident, for a, a, a visitor centre. At a meeting, I asked the representative if they had had a survey of the ground on which they were going to build this wonderful complex. And he said, well, why? I said, well, where you're building it, there's a pit, which is an endless pit, and you're going to have to put a huge slab of concrete on or pile drive. I know the area pretty well, and I know that there's things being, it's very deep. Now, that isn't being done now, for whatever reason. But if, if, camps, if people can plan these sort of buildings without doing a survey, John will tell you all about this as well. He's, I can't believe it. So I'm sorry, that's all I was going to say. Okay. But when he said that, I just, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. It's just criminal. It is criminal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to reply to whether the, the gentleman heard what he thought you had said. Uh, and then the lady uh, with the glasses on her head to be the last question, and then we're going to try and rattle through the rest of the business. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Okay, cool. We'll do that. Okay, th thank you, uh, Jeff. No, I don't think I actually um, said that. So what has happened so far is the Nicholas Joint Venture Group have done some site investigation and survey work of the land on which they've brought forward their concept for the golf resort. Um, but what will need to be done when they come forward through the planning process is a series of more detailed technical studies to cover all of the ecology and the environment and all of those other things as well. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. So they, they've done some of that work already, but they haven't done it in the depth that they would need to do it for the planning application. So that was the point I was making. As you know, with these types of development projects, you do different degrees of work at different stages of design of the project. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, just before I bring the lady in, um, just to be clear, we have had a whole load of questions. I got some through on the 4th of March as well, the person uh, Mr. Hutchins actually asking me to ask them out loud. I thought, you know, we've had lots of time and lots of contributions. These are going to have to be passed along for written answers to be provided, um, and I'm sure that will happen. And I've handed them to Caroline um, as one of her final duties as a standing constituency manager. So, uh, okay. So the lady with the glasses. Which are now, she's now wearing. Yes. Okay. Um, so just this week, the council issued yet another misleading press statement saying that the government's forcing them to stick to standard, the standard method for the housing target and that they can't use empty homes. Um, Secretary of State recently wrote to Phil Davis and he said, I must be clear that the standard method for assessing housing need does not produce a housing target. The authorities should make a realistic assessment of the number of homes their communities need as the starting point in the process. Once this has been established, planning to meet that need will require consideration of land availability, relevant constraints, i.e. green belt, and whether the need is more appropriately met in neighbouring areas. And then, just recently in a parliamentary debate, the Housing Minister Kit Maltal said, that the government's targets were not mandatory and any inspector will accept a properly evidenced and assessed variation from that target. If, for example, you have constraints like areas of outstanding natural beauty or green belt, then an inspector should accept that. Um, so why is the barrister being employed by the council at a reported cost of £135,000 not preparing a properly evidenced and assessed variation from the target 
if it is something that a local plan inspector will accept. Now, I expect David will answer and say that the, the barrister has advised that if they stick to the standard methodology, that would be a sound local plan. But we've also just recently found out that uh, Tandridge Council in Surrey only last month submitted a local plan with a housing need figure of half of what the standard methodology calculation said, and the planning inspector found it to be sound. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. And, you know, you hit the knob. It, it started off with people saying, ooh, this, the government imposed the target. Actually, as I pointed out, primarily because David had asked David questions about it, he explained what that initial figure was all about was we are on council's own <coughs> calculation about what it believed our housing need was. It wasn't an imposed target, it wasn't a target being set down, it was the council's own uh, housing need analysis, as I understand it. So, good. So, do you want to, and not this time, it's still wrong, I, I agree, the assumptions are being. So, David, do you want to just answer the lady on those questions? That there is an incredible amount of latitude given by the letters that we've had from the Secretary of State, by the answers given by the Minister in Parliament and the decisions that the inspectors are taking in actual uh, inquiries. So, is there that latitude or are we all making it up? Right, I'll, I'll try and give a, a short and succinct answer, but there's, there's a very long answer to this, and I'm quite happy to talk to you about um, outside afterwards. Yeah. In, in, in turn, it's just at the time, you know, I'm just conscious of that and you needing to move on. So, uh, as things stand at the moment, um, at one time, there's lots of different methodologies for calculating housing need. Uh, government said, we're not happy with that, we want to have a standard methodology that's used across the country to identify what your housing needs are. So, as it stands at the moment, within the, um, the documentation that we work with, and the advice we have from our QC, is that we are best advised to use the standard method approach um, to actually determine what that housing need is. Now once we've got that housing need number, it's then a question of how do you meet that need? Can you meet those needs in your area? Do you put them somewhere else? Where do you do that and so on? And, and that's informed by various things to do with our assessments around housing needs and so on in our schmar and schla uh, and all the rest of it. So that's a very short answer, but there is a longer, more detailed answer um, to that question. Uh, which might pick up the points you were raising, Karen, yeah, but just for time, if that will yeah. do. Yeah? Okay. Um, <laughs> you're, but as it's you, yeah. this is only your third David, with respect, you really didn't answer the question there. The question was, why can't we deviate from the target? You've just explained why we are sticking to the target. Why can't we deviate from the target if other councils are doing it? Exactly. Exactly. It's, not it's not a case of what other councils are doing. You have to look at what our needs are here in Wirral. Okay. Okay. okay, okay. My suspicion is that David's answer is in the very long answer that he wants to give. I, I tend to go with the fact that we just written that this, this is now what the uh, Secretary of State has said, what the Housing Minister has said, and evidenced what planning uh, appeals or planning discussions are actually doing. So it strikes me, of course, there is that flexibility, and that there are other things at work which are suggesting that the council doesn't have that flexibility. I keep saying this, I'll go back to it. I remember. Way back when Phil Davis wrote the letter wanting a three -year, agreeing to a three-year financial settlement with the Secretary of State, which he never opens up to, but that's what he did. And he said the way he was going to meet the budget gap was by building houses, uh, executive homes, where he's going to generate increased council tax off the back of those houses. That is a public document. That is what uh, the leader of council said he was going to do. And if you want my opinion, given 
where they want to build the houses and why they want to release green belts is so that they can build executive houses and raising the council tax off the back of those houses. And that is what it's about. And that's why we're taking the approach. Of course, I'm sure a number of people need to disappear because this um, this just gets really more exciting as we go along. So, item six, getting the basics right, implementing a new model for community engagement. Away you go. Again, just a little time. Uh, so this report has been taken to all the constituency committees and it follows on... Can we give it a couple of minutes and allow uh, people to... Uh... This of course was the, uh, the Jerry Ellis School of Public Routine which was, which was always to find something that the public really engaged in and make sure you stick it on the agenda which was the, the Jerry Ellis methodology of being relevant. equally across all four committees will become 250,000 and be allocated into ward budgets. So this report deals with the, the indicative figures that are being allocated to those ward budgets which are weighted, the government's arrangements around that and the principle uh, that there will be a single team to support active members. Um, that will be the staffing from the current constituency teams. So there's four appendices attached to the report. Appendix A deals with the indicative board budgets. They'll be recalculated at the start of the new municipal year. Appendix B provides some extra guidance to ward members around the execution of those budgets. And that and the application form at Appendix C are still subject to some very minor tweaks, uh, but most of the details is as will be. And then the final appendix, Appendix D, deals with uh, which staff will be allocated to which areas. This is a short term arrangement until um, the staffing structure is um, adapted to meet the needs of this new model. So I'm happy to take any questions. Um, does anyone have any questions? The only quick comment I would make is it's becoming clearer that. Ice Kirby and Thurston Stone and Roy Lake and Mel's walls are looking to go back to the old area forum approach. So in terms of the officers that look after those buildings, it would make sense if it was the same officer as opposed to two, which is the executive staffing allocation. So uh, and is that Fair uh, comments? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not making all this up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. All right. As I say, um, you know, the whole council votes in favour of it, so there's no point me moaning on about it. But uh, I am somewhat uh, looking forward to going back to the local area forum. Okay. That's super. Thank you. Update from community reps. That, that would be you, Jackie. Well, there's only one on the select. The others gave up the ghost years ago. I've been on my own now for years. I'm quite happy. But I would suggest to the table tennis group that you look at the underspends in the community fund and see if your councillors can find the money for you. Thank you. Um, if I just say that Hoylake Ward and Mel's Ward 
have so many community groups that we never have enough funds uh, to get grants from. We're always overspent, uh, and what, which is why some of our groups don't get the help. And that is because we do the work that over the years the councils have stopped doing. And that is why Hoylake is the MLs, is the envy of other villages who blame us and say we get all the money and, the, and resources from the council. I've got news for you, we do not. 35,000 we pay for the lights this year and we even pay for the electricity when the lights are on. So we as community groups in Hoylake, and there are 44 community groups, we would meet on a regular basis and that is where we deal with the things that are important to our community. And if all the other boards in the world did the same, we would be a much better place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well okay, uh, that's a fitting final uh, community update, I think, if you don't mind me saying so. Um, question time we've done. Any other business? I think we talked about this, didn't we, in terms of the, uh, of, of the briefing. Uh, and Caroline, I don't think you've got a further update for us, you? Uh, so, just very quickly going through the budget update for this committee. The community fund, as we heard today, is underspent. The figure there of just over 19,000 is now 18,000 because the application for Bertram Tennis Club is agreed. That's an uncommitted underspend, and any underspends will be returned to the council at the end of this financial year. And last but the wise committed. Which ends when precisely? The end of March. The end of March. Okay. Uh, in relation to the ward budgets, uh, there's two charts there. The first is the current position, and Helen's been engaged with a number of members about the potential spends that are going through the process at the moment. So the anticipated position, and again, th this was based on um, a few days ago, so it might have changed slightly is just over £2,300 worth of money spent. Just turning over the page, dealing with the two devolved budgets, there's underspends on the tackling antisocial behaviour budget and the community cleanups. Both of those um, will be returned into a central pot and there will be targeted activity based around antisocial behaviour and yeah, there's, there's very limited time to... Well, we can to offer police that. over time to go up and down the... Uh, uh, up and down the... We're away, whether apparently it keeps them wrecking all the street furniture or the rest of them. We're away, so we can do that. Can we? Um, and then just to conclude, the road safety money, the transport, transport plan for growth fund, um, this wasn't circulated, but members will hopefully have in front of them a list of potential schemes. You might recall that there was one elected member for each ward that formed part of a road safety plan, and this is the short list that was brought together by that group. So the recommendation is that the committee formally endorses that, and those schemes can proceed and spend your remaining budget. Okay, two things there then. So I'm sure we'll all endorse these schemes as listed. They were also circulated to us prior to that. Uh, so thank you for that. Can we all endorse those? Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, the issue of the uh, potential for the council's resources not finding its way to the community as the council intended. I think we need to have a mechanism by which we can 